morning, everyone. And uh, so um, first, I have to apologize for not being able to uh, 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 log into the GoToWebinar, and which actually is one of the, uh, the applications was blocked by the FDA. So I have to give these presentations, and uh, I looked at my own screen, and Barry will uh, flip the slides for me. And uh, also, I'd like to thank Anna Barry and the corner to invite me to talk in this webinar. And uh, what I'm going to do, and Barry already mentioned, and uh, I'm going to talk about um, the one of the projects that we have been working on for decades now called the Liver Toxicity Knowledge Base, or LTKB. And the LTKB has a, a multiple components. and uh, so one of the components I'm going to talk about today is uh, about how to develop an in situ approach to predict drug-induced and liver injury. So um, next slide, please. As Barry already mentioned, I uh, come from the U.S. Food and the Drug Administration, or FDA, and nowadays FDA has been on the news quite a bit. Uh, and actually, uh, in the early this weeks, our commissioner made an announcement of uh, uh, approved uh, emergency authorization use of the convalescent plasma for treatment of the COVID-19. However, I do want to point out that uh, FDA is a large organization. So we have uh, eight centers. Um, I'm working at the National Center for Toxicological Research, or the NCTR. Uh, which is focusing on the regulatory science research. Uh, within NCTR, we have uh, six research divisions. Um, I'm head of the division of the bioinformatics and the biostatistics. Next slide, please. So and within my division, and we have uh, four branches, and the bioinformatics branch, um, biostatistics branch, scientific computing branch, and the research to review and the return. And uh, we also have uh, around 60 and uh, peoples, and we mainly working in the area of the drug safety, which I'm going to talk about today, and uh, toxicogenomics, and endocrine disruptors, and the rare disease, and drug repositioning, and the precision medicine. Now, it's a division and mainly focus on the bioinformatics and the biostatistics. It is not even possible to take a three steps into our field without using some sort of the AI and the machine learning. So the AI and the machine learning is our long-standing efforts and we literally apply uh, these methods for the every uh, research area and we are conducting. And we even have a, a special uh, team called the Air Force Team, which stands for AI Research Force, uh, which and uh, take on many, many important and the projects. Next slide, please. So, and uh, this slide just uh, uh, give you some ideas in what particular areas and we are working on with the AI, and we have a, a quite a larger portfolio to apply AI uh, for the drug safety, which I'm going to talk about today. And we also apply AI for food safety. And uh, we have been doing um, a long time now, uh, another large consortium efforts to apply AI to identify genomic biomarkers. And we have a number of the paper published in this area um, in, in the nature by technology. And if you are of interest to, to learn more about our AI efforts for the genomic biomarkers, you just Google my names, the paper should be uh, pop up. And another area is our current focus and emphasis is on the, on the uh, is a, to apply AI uh, for the natural language processing of the FDA documents. Uh, every time I give a presentation, so then people always have the question, says, hey, FDA has a lot of the data. Could you release this data to the public use? 
And my standard answer is FDA do not have a lot of the data. We have a lot of the documents. For example, we have a FDA have a guidance document. Uh, we have a drug labeling document, which I can to uh, briefly mention uh, later on. This is a very, very large uh, document uh, and literally have over 130,000 on the document. And each document also quite large, about 20 pages and 80 sections and contain a lot of the information related to the drugs. So you may say this is considered one of the large a data set that we have in FDA. And we also have approval letters and meeting minutes and so on and so forth. So AI for the FDA documents of a tremendous import, importance to improve our agency's operations and, uh, and as well as to regulate it, the, the, the AI um, uh, driven and device in FDA. Um, as I said, today I'm only going to talk about AI uh, for the drug safety. Next slide, please. So uh, what I'm going to do today, and I'm going to first talk a little bit about drug-induced liver injury. I assume not everyone is familiar with the drug-induced liver injury. We call it a daily. And I can tell you a little bit about why we care and the water all the challenges to predict the delay. And then I'm going to uh, briefly summarize what we do in the liver toxicity knowledge base and how we address the challenges associated with the prediction of a drug-induced liver injury. And in the second part of my presentation, and I'm going to zoom in in one specific component of the LTKB project, uh, which is related to in silico prediction of the drug-induced liver injury. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what has been done and what is the opportunity of the deep learning in this area. And lastly, I'm going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, one of the new deep learning and approach we developed uh, for, daily for daily predictions we call the deep daily. And, uh, so here we go. And the next slide, this is going to be the slide six. And uh, to summarize the drug-induced liver injury, and uh, Barry, would you just click uh, uh, a few times and uh, uh, show the entire slides? So and uh, what is the drug-induced liver injury? Now, basically, that means and the liver get injured and by taking the drugs. So the first signal of the liver injury is we call the ALT elevation. Now ALT is a special enzyme, it's a liver enzyme, and when liver get damaged, the cell is broken. Uh, this particular enzyme released to the bloodstream. So if you go to the physical uh, examinations and you did a blood test, and uh, if you drink a lot of the alcohol before you did the blood test, you will see significant ALT elevations. And uh, so this is the first sign of the liver injury. But I do want to point it out, the liver is an extremely strong organ. If you cut in half, it will grow back. So just that strong. So when doctors see your ALT elevated, and they did not really pay too much uh, uh, serious attention. They just asked you to go back and to come back to test again. That is because ALT is not just specific, specific for the liver, but for the other organs as well. For example, if you fill up the stairs, if you go to the doctor, you will see the ALT elevation, okay? And however, you don't, fit, you don't fill up the stairs every day, right? So two weeks later, if your ALT is still elevated, that means truly your liver get some level of the damage. But that's still okay because the liver is a very strong organ, can recover by themselves. However, if the second enzyme called the total bilirubin elevated, now you are really in big trouble. Now, total bilirubin, TBL, it measures the liver function. That means your liver is starting to fail. But once the TBL starting to shooting off, 
you really have a not much choice left to save the liver. The only way is to do the liver transplantations. And of course, there is not many liver lying along for that kind of the purpose. So um, people died and uh, without liver transplantations. So there is a two major questions in, in, in the field of the drug-induced liver injury. And first, more on the clinical space. And we ask the questions, if we see a patient have an ALT elevations, how we know uh, the TBL enzyme is going to follow, right? Now, unfortunately, and there is a no reliable biomarkers available nowadays uh, to make a, such a determination. And uh, the reason this is a very important question is, if you have a five patients walking to the hospitals with the same level of the ALT elevations, that means liver get injured, if you do nothing, four of them are going to walk out of the hospitals is safe. One going to die. This is just a statistics. But the problem is we don't know which one I going to survive, which one going to die. So we really needed to develop a reliable biomarkers to pinpoint uh, which patients need intensive care and which patients and we can let go. So another important question is more on the drug development space and how we can come up a drug is safe. It's not produce too much damage to the liver. Okay, so this is really is the pre my presentation is for. I'm not going to talk about the clinical application. I'm only going to talk about the drug development. Next slide, please. So why we care? And I can give you a long list of the reasons you should care about the delay in the drug development. Uh, and I just said that I'm not going to go through all these lists. I'm just going to tell you, delay is the top two reasons for the drugs that failed in the clinical trials or failed in the post-market surveillance, okay? So close to 50% of the drugs that failed in the clinical trial or from or withdrawal from the market due to the liver injury, which actually is not detected by existing preclinical models. So that really means the current preclinical model, such as like the animal model, is not very effective. So now the community has been focused on developing uh, alternative approaches and for improved data predictions. And there is a long range of alternative approaches have been investigated. And here I'm just list the three, uh, uh, the high throughput method, including in silico approach, and genomics or in vitro method. Now, if you conduct the high throughput screening approaches, you really need to have a large number of the drugs with the known daily toxicity in humans to start with. So it turns out, uh, next slide please. It turns out this is a quite difficult to do and easy to say because when we develop a drugs, and we normally drug it's a safe. That's the whole idea. And uh, and but once you release to the larger populations, or you do the clinical trial, involve two thousand or three thousand patients, only very few going to suffer suffer the liver injury, right? So we can look at this uh, liver injury issues and from the three aspect. And the first is that indeed this particular drugs cause liver injury, we call the causality assessment. This actually is very difficult to do. We have an international consortium being established, simply try to establish certain rules uh, to make the causality assessment. And the part of the reason is when the patient walk into the hospitals and they usually ill, they took multiple drugs, sometimes they even took the dietary supplements, so everything was messed up, and you really don't know which drugs indeed cause liver injury. So the causality assessment is extremely important. And the second is the incidence. When we release a drug to the market, and we are 
it certainly have a lot of the benefit. That's the whole idea. We 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 have the drugs, and but only few cases uh, of the liver injury going to occur. Now the question is, how many cases you consider this drug as dangerous, right? Ten, hundred, thousand. This is very subjective. Okay, it's not objective. The lastly is the severity. Well, if someone took the drugs and dead, the liver was uh, a needle liver transplantation, we know that drug is bad and it's very severe. But sometimes uh, they only cause mild elevation of the ALT enzyme, as I mentioned in the very beginning, and, but it affects 1,000 of them or maybe 10,000 of them. And which one's more important? How we assess the severity? So if we look at the risk of a drug to cause liver injury, we need to look at the three parts. How likely this drug will cause liver injury, how many, or how severe. And this is not a science. This has become an art. It's entirely objective. So if you read the literature, you need to pay attention. When they say this drug will cause liver injury, and you need to pay attention what particular the criteria and they use. Uh, for example, um, a lot of the uh, uh, people using the number of the case reports, and they consider if there is a 10 case report, they consider this drug uh, is a toxic. And uh, so for us, I think this is very much bias. So on the right side of the slide, and uh, what we take on this problem, we decided to use FDA drug labeling documents and as i mentioned earlier on and this is a quite a complex uh, and uh, a document and for every drugs we have a labeling documents and uh, there is around 80 sections and subsections and there are three sections that specifically report at the adverse events so by reading these three sections and we will be able to make a determination on uh, which drugs are likely going to cause liver injury, which one is not cause liver injury. So we take on, um, on, on this work back into the 2011, and we published the first paper, and we generate so-called the benchmark and data set, and we look at the 286 drugs. And later on, we looked at all the drugs, okay? And this data set is called the daily rank, and it con uh, consists of uh, a little bit over 10,000 or 1,100 drugs, and uh, also published in the drug discovery today in the 2016. And more recently, and we further expanded that list and by including more drugs, and some of the drugs was released in the Japan and the Euro Europe and in other Asian countries as well. So now we are have a close to 1,300 drugs, which has been uh, annotated and, uh, 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 for their potential on the, the drug induced liver injury. Sorry, I have a call here. Okay, so, and, uh, so now we have a large list of the drugs be well annotated. Now we are ready to develop a predictive models. Next slide, please. So, and on the top left, and I show on the liver toxicity knowledge base, what do we do there? The first and the task is to develop a systematic approach to make a determination on which drugs causing liver injury, which one is not based on drug labeling document. That's what I just already mentioned in the previous slides. And, and then we curated a lot of the data for these drugs. That shows in the, uh, uh, the, the figures in the here. And we collect the data related to the drug intrinsic properties, and such as uh, uh, lipophilicity, uh, the daily dose, and so on and so forth. We also collect a lot of the data, uh, the genomics data, uh, the in vitro data, histo pathology data, and as well as a clinical uh, data uh, as well. So we use these data to develop a predictive models. 
Okay. And on the right side, and show some of the models we developed, it's not all of them because you, you can see we have a lot of the data used to develop models. Um, so it's not showed all on the right side, but we, uh, we developed the models using the mechanistic uh, the informations. Uh, we, we applied the QSAR approaches, and we also developed the model using in vitro and the genomics data. Uh, on the top right, and, uh, and the, in 2016, on the Nature Medicine published in uh, news articles to describe and our efforts to predict the drug-induced liver injury. The title is called the Foretelling Toxicity, and the FDA researchers work to predict the risk of the liver injury from the drugs. And uh, I really highly recommend this article. It's not just because I talk about our project, but because um, um, then they interviewed and the renowned scientists from the academia, uh, industry, as well as FDA, to get a sense of how the approach we use can, can uh, improve the drug development, also improve our regulation. Um, for the liver toxicity. So it is a very balanced view, and I highly encourage you and everyone to read these articles. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm going to move to the uh, second part of the, my presentation. So as I said, I'm going to zoom in, only going to talk about the in silico part of the LTKB project. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what has been done so far and I'm going to share some of the, my opinion on what is the opportunity of the deep learning in this area. And I'm going to share some of the results uh, about how we can use the transfer learning to develop or to improve uh, daily predictions. And lastly, I'm going to introduce um, and a new method that we developed called the deep daily, uh, the which, and uh, instead of the using or generate a feature representations, we, we generate the model representations, which shows amazing and the results. Uh, next slide, please. And why just click, um, yeah, click three times. So on the, on the top is about the QSAR, because when you talk about in silico approach to predict a certain biological endpoint, the first thing come to your mind is the QSARs. And the, the, the principle of the QSAR is by assuming the chemical structures determine the biological endpoints. So the way we do it is we generate some sort of the molecular representation we call the chemical descriptors, which can be 1D descriptors or 2D descriptors or 3D descriptors, right? And then we apply some sort of the machine learning or AI method to correlate on the molecular representation with the biological outcomes. So this is what we do. And in the early days, this is exactly what we do. That shows in the bottom. And it's the model we published in the Tox Science Journal back in the 2013. And uh, this we used uh, a daily rank data set. And we have uh, around 200 drugs uh, to build the models. And uh, we used the 777 descriptors, which is in-house descriptors, okay? It's developed by ourselves. And we also apply decision forest. This is not a random forest. It's a decision forest. It's developed by us as well. We use the FDA. So we use the in-house package. And the, based on the 200 drugs, develop the models. And then we evaluate these models using three external data set. The first one is the NCTR set, second, second one called the greening set, and the last one is a SHU set. Now in the rest of the, my presentations, I'm not going to repeatedly mention these three external validation sets because I don't pay too much attention on the training set results. You always can get a very, very good training results, but that really does not mean anything. Uh, when step outside of the training to predict the external validation set. So my emphasis is on the external validation set. Uh, next slide, please. So and uh, three years later, and after we published that, uh, that work in the talk science, 
I noticed another paper was published uh, in the Frontier and Environmental Science, and that's in the top, uh, in the bottom right. So here is a citation. It turns out that the, 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 the group of the scientists is our long-term collaborators, okay? So they entered the TOX21 challenge and by deliver a very, very nice model called the deep TOX and basically using the deep learning for the toxicity predictions. So out of the 12 assays in this challenge, they are the top perform performer of the half of them. So this is quite a, a, a interesting. So I reach out to them, that's going to be the next slide. And why you just click twice and for that slide. So I reach out to them and I say, hey, this is a sounds very interesting. And here's the, the data set. We already published in the talk science and the, we have everything given to you, show what you can do with it and see whether your deep talks is better than the decision forest we develop or it's a compatible. So this is what they did. They, they, uh, this is the, 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 the bar chart shows in here. And uh, let's just forget about the support vector machine. I think that they did something, um, did not optimize the, the model. But the decision DF model shows something here. It's a decision forest model. This is the results from us. And this, the bar chart shows the NGTR validation set, okay? And then the, the, the third bar shows the using the deep talks, but applying to our descriptors. The last bar shows the using the deep talks applied to their descriptors. Now you can see the deep talks does perform better than our models. And particularly, they showed advantage when large number of the descriptors was used. And however, if you look at the table more closely, their results, they only show better results for the NCTR data set. But for the Greeny and the Shoes data set, the results are actually even worse compared to ours. So we have the explanation for that. And simply because the NGTR data set, that particular validation set, share a lot of the similarity to the training set. So it looks like deep learning and the over-trained, over from the training set, which give a good prediction for the, data, for the similar data set, in this case, as the NGTR data set. But once you move away, and from the, uh, the, the homogeneous environment uh, and using the greening data set and shoes data set, the results are actually even worse. And uh, the next slide, please. But the one thing, and also you need to click a couple of times, uh, uh, click once that'd be enough. Um, the one thing we, we, we failed is uh, uh, the, the, the large number of the molecular representation does improve the, the deep learning performance. So on the left side, we already know in the field of the QSAR, we have a two type of the descriptors. One is more uh, physical chemical descriptors and using the 1D, 2D uh, descriptors. Another one is more on the theoretical descriptors like, uh, uh, like a, a fingerprint, right? But because the advancement of the AI, now we will be able to generate an entirely new set of the descriptors, either based on the text document or the graph. Now for the text, we have a smile, so we have an inch code, so we can develop the machine translation between the smiles and the inch, you just consider this uh, translator between the English and the French, right? we will be able to generate the high level representations for the molecules is only based on the text. We also can base on the graph to generate the graph uh, theory models uh, to, uh, uh, for the chemicals. So next slide. And uh, uh, could you uh, press twice, please? So, so this is what exactly what we did. And on the top left, and we, uh, generate and uh, that the high level molecular representation consider molecular descriptors using the smiles encoding and decoding. And this work is not done by us. Okay, this work was published in the chem science 
by the same group I mentioned before is our long-term collaborators. I send the data set to them, they generate the descriptor for us, and then we develop the models. And turns out the model results, it's, uh, um, it's not that significantly improved. And then we, we accidentally end up running into another paper, which is published in 2015, and the right after our publication, they use our data set, but they're using the graphic encoding approach based on the AI principles to generate a high level uh, representation um, for each individual chemicals. So the results shows in this table. Now this table is a directly cut and paste from that paper. And you can see it on the on the left side is the NCTR. Uh, these are three uh, external validation set. On the left side is the results from that paper. On the right side is the results from the original publication uh, um, from us. And then you can see on uh, the a result is quite a comparable. I, I'm not going to say their result is much better than our, ours. So, and from these uh, limited investigations, we found that using AI-based molecular representation really does not provide any specific advantage. So, and uh, so, and then we started to think about why this is the case. This is the next slide, please, uh, slide 16. And uh, why this is the case is, well, when you conduct a toxicology study, we often facing a challenge of the small sample size. So we never had a large sample size. And the deep learning only work well with the large sample size. So how you can get along with this challenge? So one way you can do it using so-called transfer learning. Right, you can build a models, and uh, based on the very, very large number of the uh, compounds, and then you transfer using this so-called pre-trained models, and to transfer to a specific endpoints of the interest by fine-tuning these models. This is exactly what we did. We picked the log p to develop the large models. Um, the, the reason we picked the log P is because the lipophilicity is a really important for the drug induced delivery injury. So we wanted to choose an, uh, a, a data set, have a, some sort of the resemblance to the drug induced delivery injury. So we develop a, a models and then we fine tuning with the, our own data set, a data, a data set. So the results are used on the right side on the tables. And uh, in short, we did not see any improvement. Now, of course, there is a, this is just our, this is still in process and we, it's still in progress and we only did a few tries and the results is not that encouraging, but I think this, this is a, a, the direction and uh, uh, warrant to further investigation. So this is what we are doing uh, right now. Uh, next slide, please. And because the transfer learning does not give us a too much an advantage, so what we decided to do is say, so, okay, why we change the way of constructive deep learning instead of the, using the molecular representation, can we using the model representation, which it shows on these two graphs. On the left side is the conventional way to develop a deep learning. And the, the first layer is the molecular features. And the next layer is the molecular representations, and then you do the predictions. But we replace the first layer of the molecular feature with the model results. And we generate like 200 or 300 models, and we feed in to generate the model representations. So the result is amazing. And if you look at the bottom on the, the, the tables, you can see and we call this method called the deep daily, and the, the, the uh, highlight is red, and uh, compared to um, that the, the model has been reported, the one is a talk science, that means it's our own models, at JCIM is the results published in the 2015 I mentioned earlier on. So our results shows much better. Next slide, please. So, and uh, I, this is, uh, is my last slide, and just give you a summary. And actually, we we did much more uh, than I presented today. And this slide summarizes some of the lessons we learned from this process. And first of all, we, in terms of the molecular representations, 
we really feel you need to use the chemical property descriptors instead of the using the fingerprint and all of that. But, but first of all, they are very difficult to interpret and the results cannot be explained. And, but they did not really show uh, uh, much advantages over the chemical descriptors. So um, this is our recommendation. Now in terms of the algorithm and whether we should use the deep learning or no deep learning, well, um, based on our experience, um, the, we found that some of the simple machine learning methods often generate very, very good results. So I'm not going to rule out uh, the simple machine learning method, and uh, normally they are also much easier to explain. Uh, and so um, the, before you really venture into the deep learning, and I highly encourage you to uh, try the machine learning method first. Now, how about deep learning? And clearly, deep learning shows a, shows a lot of that advantage when you have a large data set. That's, for, that's definitely true. Unfortunately, in the field of the toxicology, we don't have the large number of the chemicals to work with. And at least for the, uh, for the delay, and we have not shown uh, too much advantage of the conventional uh, deep neural network, okay? So we, we did not see too much improvement. As I said, we continue to work in this area. And we did find that the model representation way out of perform the feature representations. And uh, the, the deep delay shows very encouraging results. So and uh, we have a large number of the people and, in, and uh, involved in the liver toxicity and the knowledge base project. And I only highlight the four people here because these are the four people mainly focus on the in silico uh, component of this project. And uh, some of the work was done by, by, by them. And Dr. Chichao Liu is, a, is our senior scientist and his specialty is in the AI. And Tini is our postdoc. And Ming Jing Chen and Lei Hong Hu and the both has been uh, a tremendous on the, in, uh, for the LTKB project. I also like to take, a, uh, take a, this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Shraddha Tucker. And uh, he, she actually uh, used to work in my division. Now she's working in the CEDAR and she is our voice in the, in the other part of the FDA to promote our work. And Dr. Jürgen Bullock and the Ruth Roberts is our long-term collaborators. And uh, with that, I uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. And again, I do apologize for not being able to show my face. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I'm... I, have, I think I, we have time for questions.